to the show Beyond the Journal, where we discuss social media, digital education, and current controversies and open questions in cancer and medicine in general. I'm Dr. Jack West, Associate Clinical Professor in Medical Oncology at the City of Hope Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. I'm happy to be joined by my co-host, Dr. Charu Agarwal, who is the Leslie M. Heisler, Associate Professor of Lung Cancer Excellence at the University of Pennsylvania's Abramson Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Charu. Hi, Jack. Uh, today, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Patrick Ford, who is an associate professor at the Hopkins Bloomberg Kimmel Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy in Baltimore. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much, Jerry and Jack, for inviting me. I'm glad to, to be here and looking Excellent. forward to the chat. Well, let's just get started. I'd uh, like to open with just that immunotherapy is part of cancer treatment now for a very broad range of cancers managed by general oncologists, obviously, in, in most settings. Most cancer centers don't have a center for cancer immunotherapy like, like you do at Hopkins. And uh, how focused are you on immunotherapy compared to general lung cancer? Uh, and uh, how much of a distinction is there at Hopkins where you've been doing it about as long as anybody? And, and do you feel that immunotherapy, immunotherapy is potentially so nuanced in terms of just managing the side effects and other complexities that there needs to be a, a subspecialist or a, a group of subspecialists in immunotherapy in particular? Yeah, I think they're all good questions, Jack. It's, um, we were, uh, so I started at Hopkins back in 2011, and um, it was just around the time when I think my first year at Hopkins, Judy Bramer presented some of the um, of the results from the early phase one trials of, of anti-PD-1 in lung cancer. And uh, I think around that time, we were, uh, we were all excited, and uh, I was lucky enough to do my fellowship with Julie, and we... Um, we were for about four or five years there. We were treating patients on trial. Um, so anything from first line to, to second or third line with single agent PD-1 and seeing results. And I think as time went by, it became clear where we're going to see approvals and where we're going to see activity of these agents. And more recently, I have focused mainly on early stage lung cancer uh, with immunotherapy and also on mesothelioma. Um, at our center, we have nine thoracic oncologists and we've we all treat and manage and help uh, whatever patient comes in the door, um, uh, no matter what their their disease is in terms of thoracic oncology. Yeah, but we seek um, uh, knowledge and advice from uh, from some uh, from sub specialists. And to say, for example, someone someone has a particular interest in EGFR, I might reach out to them at Hopkins or at another site to get advice. And the same with immunotherapy. I think um, uh, some of us just have had experience going back about 10 years. Others are more recent to the field. And I think we can all learn from each other. So, Patrick, when we think about, um, you know, your involvement with immunotherapy and early stage lung cancer, of course, the success of neoadjuvant therapy comes to mind. So congratulations on your work in the space, both uh, dating back to the experience with nivolumab alone and most recently with Checkmate 816. Um, you know, we uh, in the lung cancer world have uh, truly accepted adjuvant therapy following definitive surgical resection as the norm, um, as that's been the modality to show survival benefit and the ease of really uh, using pemetrexid, uh, for example, based regimens in the adjuvant space, making it um, somewhat easier than the more historically based chemotherapy regimens. Uh, but now, you know, with the chemoimmunotherapy data, as well as the immunotherapy data, there is a resurgence of interest in the new adjuvant space. And also in the adjuvant space now, we saw data with the use of um, atezolizumab in the post-resection, post-chemotherapy setting. 
Um, so not that you're biased or anything, but what do you think is going to be, um, you know, the the norm? Uh, do you think it's going to be new adjuvant or will we be more reluctant to use that approach uh, based on historical precedent? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's great to see these changes, you know, or these, these potential changes. I was I was giving uh, my annual talk to our fellows on on early stage lung cancer. And I've been giving it for about seven years now. And for the first five years, there were very few changes. And last year I added Adora. And this year I added um, the initial data from, from Checkmate 816 and Empowered Azera 10. So I think I think we're finally starting to see some new developments for resectable lung cancer. Um, there are differences between the two studies, between Checkmate 816, and, and which was neoadjuvant therapy and um, Empower 10, which was adjuvant tezolizumab, uh, I think both in the patients enrolled. Um, so Checkmate 816 um, enrolled clinical stage patients, so, uh, so not pathological stage. Um, they were based on imaging and also in, in some cases uh, minimally invasive uh, mediastinal staging. Um, so it's a broader population of patients in general. It was also skewed more towards stage 3A, so clinical stage 3A, which was about 64% in Checkmate 816 versus about 40% in Empower 010. Um, so it's a little bit, it's not quite apples and oranges, but they're different populations of patients, I would say. And there will be selection based on some of those clinical characteristics, as well as some of our molecular markers potentially eventually. But neoadjuvant, inherently has some differences from the adjuvant platform, like you get this feedback of, of how it worked that you don't get with adjuvant where you're really treating blind uh, and you, you get radiographic feedback, you get pathologic response feedback. And uh, in particular, I'm impressed that in Checkmate 816, you're seeing these results with just a very finite, relatively short course of treatment, not a year or more of therapy. That I think is a big deal for early stage patients who want to move on with their lives rather than have their, their issues with dealing with cancer extend uh, as a more chronic issue. So what do you think of the inherent differences in these platforms between neoadjuvant and, and adjuvant and whether there's a compelling reason to favor neoadjuvant or, or adjuvant, I guess, uh, you know, because one of the other issues is uh, that at least the patients may want to just get it out as opposed to do something else and maybe have something happen on the way before they get to surgery. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've 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 heard that a lot from from surgical colleagues, and that they'll have a patient come in, and the term uh, "get it out" is is very, I think, in a surgical clinic. Um, I think it does take a nuanced discussion, Jack, in terms of of why you might want to do systemic therapy first. Um, there's the preclinical data, and just briefly, is is. There's a small amount of preclinical data, a mouse study suggesting that neoadjuvant immunotherapy might be preferable to adjuvant in, immune, in immunocompetent mouse models. Um, but I think, it, it, so it's modest. Uh, the clinical data, I think one of the, the big advantages is that in vivo, in, so in the actual patient, you get a, a sense of, of whether um, this therapy is doing something to the primary tumor um, in terms of pathological response. And I think that is why we initially started doing this uh, these studies. Um, the study we published a few years ago uh, with Navoya Mabalone, the intention of that study re really was, it was very focused on the science. It was looking at the correlative endpoints, but kind of almost serendipitously, we saw uh, pathological responses with just two doses of nivolumab. And then around the same time, uh, chemoimmunotherapy was starting to come to the fore for metastatic lung cancer. And, uh, and as that happened, we added, or we changed Checkmate 816 after about, a, I think it was about nine months of accrual, uh, we added an arm of chemo plus nivolumab. And that eventually uh, became the primary analysis, uh, which we presented earlier this year. And it showed that uh, pathological uh, complete response increased from 
percent with chemo alone, so three cycles of chemo, and very little or no adjuvant therapy, um, versus 24 percent with chemo plus the addition of nivolumab. So you're seeing a fairly dramatic change. Yeah. PCR. Uh, we don't yet have the long-term data to show if that will translate to long-term survival, but I'm very hopeful it will. Outside of the context of a clinical trial, at this point, um, are you incorporating uh, more of a new adjuvant approach as um, standard practice at your institution or you know, still holding out and um, thinking about incorporating it in the future once long-term data reads out? Uh, I ask because um, you know, many centers are thinking of changing the way that they discuss patients with potentially resectable disease in multidisciplinary settings uh, based on the data that you presented. Yeah. Well, if I get to see the patient, I definitely discuss it. Uh, I think that's a big question because these patients are seeing patients with a potentially early stage lung cancer, see a pulmonologist and a surgeon mainly. Um, and it really depends on our colleagues to uh, to become aware of these data. And I've been, I've been impressed with the levels of interest from the surgical community in this and also to a degree from pulmonologists. Um, I think um, we all have to kind of work together in educating ourselves and our patients on the options. Um, to give you some numbers, I think among our patients, probably about two thirds of our patients receive neoadjuvant therapy for stage two or three A, and about one third end up getting adjuvant therapy. And there are various re reasons. For example, patients who live a long distance away, yeah. uh, patients who want to have therapy locally, or and generally some patients who just want to have their tumor uh, removed and are not too concerned at that very stressful period about the nuances of, of neoadjuvant versus adjuvant. And I can understand that, um, but I, I, we always try and discuss it where possible, you know. Uh, you know, 15, 18 years ago when the adjuvant chemotherapy trials came out and several in a row were positive, at that time, or going into that time, there were several neoadjuvant chemo trials that were in development, looking encouraging, Essentially, the adjuvant trial positivity killed the neoadjuvant approach. Um, are you concerned that that's a, a real risk with Empower 010, maybe others building on that momentum and really quashing the momentum of neoadjuvant work being done now? Yeah, well, I think... Um... There's about six neoadjuvant phase three trials. Um, <laughs> a lot. We have about eight adjuvant trials, so it's uh, we don't do things by half. But uh, but the the neoadjuvant trials, my understanding is near at least five of those six are very close to fully accrued. Um, and Checkmate phase one six is obviously fully accrued. Um, yeah. So I don't think we'll necessarily have the same issue. But um, I think there's one difference between Checkmate H16 and the other neoadjuvant trials and that Checkmate H16, as you mentioned, Jack, just has the three cycles of neoadjuvant therapy and then postoperatively it's dealer's choice. But I suspect a lot of patients then did not have adjuvant yeah. chemo and no adjuvant immunotherapy, whereas all the other studies have neoadjuvant chemo immunotherapy versus chemo and then a whole year of, of adjuvant immunotherapy. Yeah, and I think that's going to make it really complicated to really determine the relative contributions of each uh, component when you look at it and aggregate with a long-term follow-up endpoint. Um, speaking of, uh, you know, PAT-CR as a potential endpoint, I know we've really talked about um, that in other solid tumors in the past, you know, the traditional learning is, yes, PAT-CR can obviously speak to the effectiveness of chemotherapy or any kind of new adjuvant approach in diseases such as breast cancer. But in lung cancer, it's a relatively new concept. And do you think that this is uh, something that will be integrated more and more in the future? Uh, or do you have a sense of this has been integrated in other new adjuvant trials as well uh, as a standard measure? Yeah, well, it, it, it's interesting. I, uh, we received an RFP from one of the the pharmaceutical sponsors recently on top of their list was pathological endpoints for <laughs> for phase two trials as, as their big choice. And um, I think uh, I think it is being used more commonly. Um, uh, there's retrospective evidence perhaps to suggest so it associates with event-free survival and overall survival, but, but those data are, are retrospective in lung cancer. Um, it also 
So if the main disease type where it's been used is in is in breast cancer, and um, in that disease setting, it does have have so it's advocates and also it's it's naysayers. So I think it's um, the recent data with neoadjuvant um, chemo plus pembrolizumab and triple negative breast cancer is perhaps encouraging f- from that regard. But I think we need our own data in lung cancer and. Hopefully, Checkmate 816 will help some more with that and other studies. Um, we are using it broadly, though, I would say, in more and more early phase studies in um, using it as a kind of a, a for single arm phase two so as a signal seeking kind of um, kind of endpoint, you know. Yeah, I uh, would say I appreciate how circumspect the language was in presenting Checkmate 816. I, I I'm pretty conservative about how I interpret a lot of endpoints, but I found myself pretty close to blown away by the differences in imaging and and the path CR endpoints of of Checkmate eight one six. And this was a your presentation was not one that that went towards overstatement at all. Even I th- I think mm-hmm. went less than one might have in in a lot of trends of 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 stating things without obviously the event free survival and uh, and of course overall survival so i think that's a, a limitation but on the other hand these are impressive differences and um i would also like your your thoughts on path cr is one thing with just no evidence of of uh of disease on on uh, in, on uh, the microscopic review, but then there's residual cancer burden. You know the 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 partial credit of of a good but not complete pathologic response. So, what is your thought of, of this? Is this being incorporated more? And as this endpoint gets looked at more and more in and validated in breast cancer, do you see that helping pave the way in lung cancer and other tumor types for neoadjuvant trials? Because PATH-CR is a higher bar, as impressive as it is, it may be higher than we're missing some things with the, yeah. the, the major pathologic responses. And I say this as someone who was skeptical of that endpoint back in 2018 when you first presented, but we're getting more and more data on this, and I think it's quite encouraging. Yeah, no, I think there is um, the the other thing in Checkmate eight one six was that uh, so looking at percent residual cancer, it was ten percent with chemo chemo and volumab versus seventy seventy four percent, I think, with um, with chemo. So there's so outside of those patients who get a PCR, there still seems to be significant difference in in um in the amount of residual cancer um i think uh major pathologic response uh, there was a huge effort a couple of years ago by the the islc and fda to kind of validate it or to at least put the data together and see see where we stand and there was a position paper in jto on it um uh, uh, so i think one one issue is that so when we add pd1 to chemo and we see these PCRs. I, so I don't know if we're going to see those PCRs when we add novel agents without chemo. Um, and that's potentially where where NPR might be useful. Um, the other question, though, with NPR is what do you measure as the as the um, tumor bed or the tumor? Um, because you're measuring a percent of something. Um, whereas with PCR, um, if you find, if you adequately sample the tumor and you find nothing well that's a pcr if you adequately the, the sample at the tumor which you define as the tumor or some criteria define as the tumor and you get say a thousand cells at what is at what percentage is that and there are there are efforts ongoing um janice taub who i work with here at hopkins she's um led a lot of the efforts with the society for the immunotherapy of cancer and there are also um, there's an IASLC working group specifically on PCR and um, and NPR, which is ongoing and which is trying to put together all the data from the neoadjuvant trials, um, immunotherapy trials, to come up with some standardization as to how we assess it. One of the things that you know is is really striking is um, the lack of molecular testing in the stage four setting for non-small cell lung cancer. Um, I, I think all of us were 
sort of appalled at uh, you know how few patients are getting tested in an in an indication or in a setting where it's absolutely recommended and backed by several different um, guidelines. Um, Checkmate 816 did exclude patients with at least EGFR and ALK. And I'm just curious, um, you know, as more and more targeted therapies um, come into the picture um, and potential results uh, start to get re re or trials start to get read out in the adjuvant setting, how do you think uh, molecular testing should be optimized um, so that potentially these patients don't get inadvertent neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapies. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, so it's going to be challenging. I think, um, uh, so I was talking with our molecular pathology lab today about another trial, which we're hoping to do for KRAS G12C in early stage lung cancer and trying to really get turnaround time down is, is, is the issue in early stage disease, especially if you're thinking of neoadjuvant trials. Um, there are platforms which can, do single genes and uh, and give a result off three slides of tissue for that single gene, um, and that could be what we we end up doing if if for uh, say hypothetically we had an approval for a chemoimmunotherapy neoadjuvant and it looked very promising and it was for PDL um, it included PDL one negative. Well, that brings up the issue as you said, Charu, about about EGFR patients, and I think that's sort of a scenario you would really want to know that your patient did not have EGFR and ALK, and want to know it quickly as well. Um, so, I think perhaps those single gene tests on the pretreatment biopsy might be useful, um, and uh, getting that turnaround in, in two or three days, and then. I'm moving and helping to move the patient in the correct direction, you know. I don't know. What do you guys think? <laughs> I think it's going to be so challenging because at, at one you know, at one end of the spectrum, we are telling everyone to do next generation gene sequencing, do broad panel testing. And, you know, in the same vein, we're saying, oh, but for these samples, just do single gene testing. And I think I worry that the messaging will just get um really mixed up and we or we'll just have to come up with pathways and algorithms that make it very clear that this is a potentially resectable patient going to surgery who needs an immediate answer in 24 to 72 hours as opposed to a patient with stage 3b disease who may be considered um, potentially resectable down the lane or you know 3a potentially resectable down the lane who we may not need a, an answer in 24 to 72 hours so I, I do think it's going to be complicated I don't know what you think Jack I, I I agree with all of that. I think the timeliness is a complex issue for stage four, more so for, for a, a potentially resectable uh, candidate. And and yeah, that's that's really an issue. As is the amount of tissue. I think the further you get from, you know, the referral centers, the the less tissue tends to be available. And so I think that's likely to, to be one more challenge of, of, uh, of the neoadjuvant approach. So I, I, I don't have a good answer. I'd, I'd like to also explore from Checkmate 816, you know, Jonathan Spicer did the presentation at ASCO of Surgical Outcomes. And again, I, I think there wasn't there was certainly no overstatement of the, the differences, but to me, it was pretty impressive that adding nivolumab to the three cycles of chemo was associated with, with remarkably shorter surgery times, about a half hour or more for just about every stage for stage. And uh, especially for the, as you showed clinically or mentioned, clinically enriched 3A population who are pretty challenging for surgery, there was a striking difference in the ability to do, um, you know, a, a VATS surgery as opposed to an open thoracotomy, and uh, uh, more common to get a, a lobectomy than a pneumonectomy uh, for these patients who are kind of on the bubble for that. And in terms of tolerability and post-operative complications, uh, at least numerically lower pain and dyspnea probably related to the less extensive surgery. I mean, what what do you think, is that a specific selling point with some traction 
potentially to patients, potentially to surgeons, or is the just get it out and the ability, you know, I, I think that one of the, the unfortunate issues is that uh, both for patients who want it out and surgeons who have an OR time potentially available next week versus sending a, a patient off for two or three months and maybe having something happen on the way means that they don't get that patient back. So yeah. what, are, what are your thoughts about the relative merits of improving the surgical experience versus complicating it? Yeah, I think um, I think those are all important points. The um, I think so. One of the more impressive things, which may not have come out so much in John's presentation, was that this was a relatively diverse group of surgical centers. So, for example, the highest accruing center, I believe, in the U.S. was a community oncology center in South Carolina, Dr. Saylor's group, mm -hmm. and and that presumably was referrals from uh, from his local thoracic surgery group to him, and they enrolled. 11 or 12 patients. So it wasn't all highly selected academic centers um, and the same worldwide. So, so Asia, Europe and, and here. Um, I think um, the, the advantages, if I was a surgeon, I'd be wondering why, why are these endpoints not being <laughs> highlighted so much as, um, as say, um, surrogate endpoints, uh, um, other surrogate endpoints. And I would, I would wonder if this was a new, say, robotic a machine which a, a surgeon could use and you would have fewer pneumonectomies, um, a better surge, a better immediate surgical outcomes, then it would probably be used, you know, uh, but because it's a drug, I think we have other metrics for how we measure drugs and how they work. Um, but I, I was personally impressed with the, the outcomes, you know, I think especially uh, the reduction in pneumonectomies and the reduced time for uh, for surgeries, you know, I think it's reassuring to our surgical colleagues. Um, we, we will depend, I think, um, how this is implemented will depend a little bit on how the data plays out. So with Empower 10, we saw predominantly pdl one positive tumors appeared to benefit from adjuvant to TESO. In Checkmate H16, at least based on PCR, we saw some benefit for pdl one negative as well. So I think we have a lot of adjuvant trials coming results and also uh, more new adjuvant trials. And if that PDL1 difference plays out, then potentially for early stage disease, for PDL1 negative tumors, uh, the only immunotherapy option might be neoadjuvant, at least in the near future. And if that's the case, I think it's incumbent on us as a as a community of oncologists to, to offer that option to patients. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And do you think there would be a role for dual immunotherapy in those patients with pdl one negative disease, uh, potentially in the early stage setting, either in the new adjuvant or the adjuvant setting? And, you know, what are your thoughts about that based on some of the data that we are seeing in the metastatic setting, even though we don't really have an approval for dual immunotherapy in this setting, but we do uh, see with long-term follow-up of trials such as Checkmate 227 that we're seeing improvements in that subset? Yeah, there was um, there was a CTLA4 PD1 arm within Checkmate H16 of Iblimumab, Nivolumab, and it's uh, the results are there in the presentation. It was a, a PCR rate of 20%, which um, if we saw it on its own would look very impressive. So 20% versus it it wasn't directly compared to the uh, to the chemo arm, but uh, it was still 2.2 up to 20%. Um, and toxicity was was not elevated, at least immediate toxicity. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think there's potentially a role there for exploring it further. I think uh, the challenge which we've had in metastatic disease is having a biomarker to tell us which patients and which tumors would benefit from combination immune checkpoint. And I think we're going to have that issue in early stage disease as well. Um, but I, I would hesitate to throw out a therapy which works very well for maybe 20% of patients. And I think we need to continue to search for those biomarkers, you know, um, and uh, and follow these patients up long term as well, uh, which they will be in checkmate H16. One of the things that uh, was interesting about Empower 010 was at least my read of it, and and I think I focus on it more than some is the PDL1 expression level and the association with benefit, which you know based on the hazard plot that was presented was far more substantial in patients with high PDL1 and 
rather modest uh, that you would infer. They they did show it in some, you know, Russian nested doll approach of PDL one one percent or higher, which includes the patients who got the big benefit. You can do the math and conclude that the the hazard ratio must have been over 0.8 and probably around 0.9 for 1 to 49 percent and it was very unimpressive at 0.97 for pdl1 less than that you, as as far as i know did, you didn't present that and and uh what's your views on on pdl1 expression and you know, where that should potentially play a role and, you know, how much of a, uh, how much of a conscious decision, you know, was that as an, uh, as a, uh, an active decision or just didn't have time, didn't, didn't get to that? Um, well, we did actually um, present the PCR data by PDL one and the, um, and the trial was stratified by PDL one So one of the reasons we didn't have to know than a lot of people was because um, because PDL one had to be tested as one of the, the inclusions. Okay. But essentially, the the results mimicked a little bit what we see with chemo, pembro, and metastatic disease. And that high PDL one, there was a very uh, close to half the patients had a PCR. If you had fifty percent or greater PDL one, um, I think it was forty four percent PCR rate. Uh, but there was still for PDL one negative tumors, it was like fourteen percent. Um, chemo nevo versus something like two percent with zero percent with chemo alone. So, so that was- that's impressive. So in in other words, and just just like say, you know, uh, keynote one eighty nine. Uh, yeah. If regardless in every setting, addition of immunotherapy improved the outcomes, even if the outcomes overall tended to be better with higher PDL one. In yes. The- yeah. 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 Good yeah. summer. And so how much did that play into our thinking for preoperative, for postoperative? I mean, you're somebody who thinks about this many hours of your day. Yeah, I think if I, we have not actually been using it um, prospectively for, for, for moving patients into trials, uh, mainly because we try and try and enroll every patient or suggest every patient. Um, but so if I was a if I didn't have a mutation and my PDL one was 100, percent I'd be very tempted to to uh, to look around to see if there's a chemo PD one trial available to me. You know, and um, so if you believe the data, which I think are valid, then then you have almost a half a 50 percent chance of of having um, having no tumor at the time of surgery. You know, um, which I think is is what most people would like to hear after they come out of the operating room. Um, but I, I think there are other questions there. Is there any selection? Is there any group of patients who say five years from now, we can treat with chemo immunotherapy and have some form of biomarker where surgery is not necessary. Um, <laughs> some of our surgical colleagues have, have brought that up, but I, I think we're a good distance, but, um, away from putting them out of business. But I think there is, there are probably some patients who are, who total neoadjuvant therapy could be could be considered in the future, maybe with the use of ctDNA and other biomarkers, you know. So yeah. during COVID, um, just shifting topics a little bit in terms of clinical trial enrollment and accrual, you know, during COVID, there were a lot of guidelines um, that came out uh, suggesting ways to sort of help depending on which part of the country you were, if you had over capacity, ICU beds available, etc. And some um, centers did actually opt to incorporate neoadjuvant uh, approaches uh, to try and sort of buy some extra time to tide over the COVID um, sort of wave or peaks and then sort of delay surgery or come in with surgery when there was a better bed availability and resource availability. Um, you know, during that time, clinical trial accrual was really hard but i'm just curious did did that actually help boost your accrual to your new adjuvant trials to sort of try and make space or delay yeah. surgical resection or that wasn't the case no um hopkins were pretty conservative on on their trials so we were shut down for about four months five months to 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 all accrual but um 
similar to what you mentioned, Terry, we we did adopt neoadjuvant therapy for for a, a number of patients, and they had pretty good outcomes. Um, ben Levy, who's my colleague down in Sibley, he, I think treated three or four patients with chemoimmunotherapy during that time period, and I think three of the four of them had PCRs, so they did well, you know. Um, but I, I, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's it's it's. I think it'll change our paradigm or we we need to probably work very closely with our surgical colleagues. And also here at Hopkins, historically, we've given trimodality, so chemo radiation followed by surgery. Um, uh, so, so when I started here as a fellow, that was almost all the patients came through, got chemo radiation for stage three disease. Um, so we've, uh, we've worked with our radiation colleagues as well to kind of discuss um, who would be a good patient trimodality too and who would be a good patient for the new trimodality which is chemoimmunotherapy followed by surgery is that the new tagline new trimodality <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we'll see but uh but i Let's not tell our radiation oncology colleagues <laughs> can yeah, i and, yeah patrick for forgive my ignorance if it's been presented but I, I, if it has it hasn't been with the fanfare of your original new england journal paper and the aacr presentation but uh, has have clinical outcomes been uh, publicized about that original study, uh, you know, from 2018, the smaller cohort. Yeah. So, so Josh Royce, who's now at Georgetown with Stephen Liu, right. he, he, he presented at ASCO now two years ago, three year follow up. And, um, it, it's a small group, but, uh, uh, so I think there were nine patients had a major pathologic response and, and 11 did not. And, um, and interestingly enough, all of the patients with active disease or who unfortunately had passed away were in the non-MPR group, um, whereas no patient who was in the MPR group had active disease at the time of, of that report. Um, do, you, do you know of any follow-up since then, obviously, since it's been? Um, yeah, none of them have, have had active, have had a relapse. Now we're close to five years out. Uh, that's, that's quite yeah. remarkable. Good for yeah. you. Yeah, it's interesting. And one, so one thing, I'd like to tease out a little bit more, and hopefully we'll see with the Checkmate H16 data are the are the patterns of relapse um, in those patients who do relapse. Because I've, it's completely anecdotal, but I've had a few patients who've had solitary sites of of relapse after immunotherapy and neoadjuvant therapy, and uh, and they've been treated definitively brain metastasis or uh, mediastinal nodal metastasis. So I'd like to see if that's something which bears out when we follow up these neoadjuvant and adjuvant trials. Can I just uh, go back to, to one issue, and that is the, the longitudinal aspect and kind of where, what do you see, what do you do for a patient who's, who's gotten neoadjuvant? Uh, do, do you then say, great, we've, we've done what we intended to do if they have a major pathologic response or, or certainly a path CR, or do you, do you uh, adhere to a, a longer standard that's kind of being scraped out with, you know, Empower 010, for instance, most of these adjuvant trials going a year, if not longer. So do you, do you feel that now with the results that you've achieved and contributed to that, that two to four cycles could be enough? I, I ask because, you know, very often when we do neoadjuvant with chemo, for instance, if we get a good result, we say, great, it worked, let's keep going. Uh, do more, double down. And if you didn't get a good result, you say, well, that didn't work. We definitely got to do more. And to me, that's just like, it's raining, yeah. you know, it's sunny, let's go get a beer or it's raining, let's go get a beer, you know? So is there anything that's going to change the results the way they do in breast cancer, potentially based on the path CR outcome? Yeah, I think so. So I think the only long-term data we have in lung cancer is from the, um, and a Nadim study from Dr. Prevencio, where he gave three cycles of chemo nevo and then a year of adjuvant nivolumab. And they had pretty remarkable, it was a single arm study, but they had two year progression free survival of, of over 75% for a stage 3A. Um, but uh, I tend to have a, I'm pretty conservative in discussions with patients who, who have been on clinical trials in that. I 
so before we had data, um, I think I, I basically went back to, to first principles and say, these are the data we have, which actually do prolong survival. So chemo prolongs survival, for example. And at the time we were doing the nivolumab studies, we had no data to say nivolumab did anything, you know? Um, so most of those patients who who would have fit the criteria for adjuvant chemo, I did recommend adjuvant chemo, even those who had a PCR. But uh, I will say most of them after a detailed discussion, those patients who had PCRs, many of them chose not to have adjuvant chemo. Right. But it's, it's really important until we have long-term survival data and um, that we continue to to rely on the on the proven data we have with chemo. And that applies to EGFR, it, it applies to um, to Empower 10 data, and also it'll apply to Checkmate 816, you know? Point well taken. Yeah. Well, this has been a really fascinating discussion, Patrick. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, I'm excited to see what the future holds for lung cancer, both in the new adjuvant and the adjuvant space. Uh, you can find us on iTunes or wherever you find our podcast content. We hope that you will subscribe and send us comments and feedback to beyondthejournalshow at gmail.com. We thank Mark Lindsay and Talk and Speaker for production and distribution support. See you in a couple of weeks with our next guest. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.